1976, mechanic Jan Selecki was roused from his bed late in the evening by what he thought was a fire. What happened next? His experience and the things he saw left UFO researchers scratching their heads for decades. It was August 1976. Jan Sedlecki, a mechanic employed at Bryden's Garage near Leeds, had labored well into the night trying to catch up on some work. He eventually grew tired and hungry and decided to close up shop and head for home. It just so happened that his house was walking distance from the garage and it didn't take him long to get back. At around 2 a.m., after eating supper and watching TV, he retired to bed. He was barely under the covers when a brilliant white glow suddenly flooded his bedroom. He looked around trying to make sense of what he was seeing and realized that it must be coming from a fire from outside. He then thought that his garage must have caught fire. He quickly jumped out of bed and ran to the window. The garage was fine. So where was the light coming from, he wondered. He looked up and observed a strange, saucer-shaped craft hovering about 10 to 15 feet off the ground. It was a glistening, deep blue color. It seemed to be wobbling, and he got the sense that it was in the process of trying to land. Sidlecki's curiosity got the better of him. He got dressed and stepped outside his front door. He wanted to get a better look at it, and so he dashed across a road and hid behind a fence. The machine was unlike anything he'd ever seen before. He watched as it hovered over a large expanse of grass about 75 yards away. The craft finally descended into the field, silently supported on several leg-like protrusions. A few seconds later, Sidlecki observed a tube descend from the center of the object, which was a few feet wide and which reached the ground. Although the entire object was dark, an unusual glow was pouring from its underside. Suddenly the tube opened, quote, like a book. Two humanoid figures, around four feet tall, walked out from the tube and stood in front of the object. They seemed to take notice of Sidlecki and began beckoning him to come closer. For some reason, Sidlecki stepped out from behind the fence and slowly began walking in their direction. He could make out that a conversation was taking place between the two entities, but he could not understand the language. The figures were odd-looking, wearing one-piece suits of a yellow-orange color and a kind of helmet with a darkened visor over the face area. They wore mittens on their hands and some kind of boots or shoes, which appeared to be integral to the suit. He also noticed a panel with a series of square-shaped switches and circular buttons on the chest of each humanoid. When the humanoids began adjusting these, Sidlecki was surprised that he recognized the words they were speaking. Like tuning into a frequency that translated speech, and he was now able to understand them perfectly, as if they were speaking his language. They told him that they were having trouble with their ship, and that they would have to make their repairs before they were able to leave. We apologize for the intrusion. As soon as repaired, we go. The tone of the voices sounded tinny, like a little boy speaking. For some reason, despite the strangeness of the situation, this bit of information seemed to put Sidlecki at ease. Sidlecki was then invited inside the lift, and he agreed. He watched the door silently close and the tube move rapidly upwards. As he bent down to walk under the hull, which was about five feet off the ground, he noticed two rows of what looked like small rotor blades turning very slowly. The doors opened out into a metal cabin. Standing on a shiny surface, he immediately became aware of the smell of, quote, rotting grass. The two figures led him up a sloping ramp that spiraled around what he took to be the ship's inner perimeter, then into a room. Around the edge of this room lay a two-foot-wide channel of flowing water 
with some kind of green grass, about two feet high, growing out of it. Sidlecki then asked about the ship, including the speed and how it was even able to fly. He isn't sure which one of the figures responded, only that it said B-13. Then another door opened. Peering into the semi-light compartment, he noticed in a far corner four or five crouched figures with their heads in between their hands and knees. Unlike the other two humanoids, they were dressed in black one-piece suits with no helmets and had brown hair. The figures were gathered beside a circular pool containing a black, bubbling, oil-like substance from which flashes of red light darted into the air. The light inside the ship was constant, an unusual yellowish-orange light coming from all the panels. There were no windows or visible openings. Suddenly, a football-sized ball of orange light darted around the room, stopping and starting randomly. At this point, Sidlecki heard the frantic clatter of footsteps from somewhere on the ship, as if people were rushing about in a panic. Sidlecki was then told by one of the figures that he would need to leave immediately, and that they had a, quote, space bug. Sidlecki did not understand what this meant. He was quickly ushered down the spiraling staircase by one of the humanoids and was told to step inside the tube. As he did so, the figure looked at Sidlecki and said, When you get out, run. Whatever was happening, Sidlecki understood that it was no joke. Suddenly the door opened and Sidlecki took off, running across the expansive field as fast as he could go. Upon passing the fence line, he looked back and saw that nothing was following him. He then heard a loud, high-pitched whistling sound. The tripods of the tube lifted inside the object. The whistling intensified, and then the object shot away at an angle of 45 degrees into the sky. He saw red fire pouring out from its underside. Sidlecki eventually returned home. He never saw them again, nor did he ever have another UFO experience. His case was covered in the UK-based magazine, UFO Magazine, Volume 15. It is unclear if the field in which the craft landed was ever inspected for evidence of footprints or landing gear. This is a truly fascinating case that begs so many questions. Who were they? Where did they come from? Sidlecki did not indicate any missing time in his report so I'm led to believe that their landing in the field near his home was not intentional, almost as if the situation was somewhat out of their hands until they were able to repair their ship. Their want to interact with Sidlecki may have been a way of buying themselves time, since he would most likely have returned home and called the police, thus bringing them more unwanted attention. By interacting with him, explaining that their vehicle was in need of repairs, something that Sidlecki, as a mechanic, would understand better than most, seemed to put him at ease. Upon entering the craft, Sidlecki asked what made the ship fly, at which point they replied, B-13. He was then shown a room with figures standing around a black, bubbling, oil-like substance. Sidlecki then indicated that he heard what sounded like frantic footsteps and he got the sense that something not good was happening somewhere else on the ship. This was then confirmed by one of the figures, noting that he needed to leave, and that they had a quote, space bug. I know when I think of space bug, my mind goes to really bad sci-fi movies, thoughts of weird, ugly creatures scuttering around in the dark, though it's entirely possible that the space bug they were referring to was some type of pathogen that they had been exposed to, or had nearly exposed Sidlecki to. This might be why the figure indicated that he needed to get away from the ship as fast as he could. That said, the Sidlecki case is interesting, and I hope you enjoy it.